ever seen those commercials where it's like, ask your doctor if a biologic is right for you? And then you're like, well, what the heck is a biologic? Basically, a biologic is going to be a medication that was made by a cell or by another biological organism, as opposed to being like synthesized from scratch by chemists in a lab. And so no offense to all the amazing chemists out there, but cells are often the best chemists. They can make molecules that are bigger and more complex than could be synthesized from scratch. These include things like proteins, things like monoclonal antibodies, maybe insulin and other hormones and growth factors. These can include things like cell-based medicines and vaccines. All sorts of products fall under this category of biologics. These include like proteins, DNA, RNA, all sorts of different stuff. All these, what these have in common is that they're made by these biological systems. Now, biological systems are really great for making these bigger molecules, but they can make them more, it makes it more variable than the chemically defined product that you would get if you were to synthesize things from scratch and then be purifying out the different intermediate steps all along the way. And so these systems can make these complex molecules, but they might differ in terms of their modifications, their folding. And so there's more variability batch to batch and things like this when it comes to a biologic, and it's impossible to truly copy it. And so instead of talking about generic versions of a pharmaceutical drug, we can, t like your typical small molecule drug, things like Tylenol or aspirin, these like chemically synthesized, chemically defined products. With biologics, we have these less chemically defined products, more complex products that can't be actually copied. And so instead of generics, we can have biosimilars. Now, even with these biosimilars, the biologics tend to be a lot more expensive. There's a lot of um, yield problems and purification things as well as that makes it more expensive to produce these biologics, as well as then they typically have to be, they're more less stable than those small molecules. So they often have to be refrigerated, they have to be injected and or IV infused instead of being swallowed because then they wouldn't survive the trip through your digestive system. So there's some complicating factors that make biologics more expensive, um, but they can be very, very useful because we can make these compounds that we couldn't make just in a lab. So today I want to tell you a little bit more about these, some of the, some examples, um, some differences between biologics and your traditional like small molecule drugs. So the term small molecule and biologic, the, the kind of distinction between them can get a little fuzzy. But basically, a small molecule, this is going to be something like your typical pharmaceutical drug. So I'm just going to use the term drug when I'm talking about drug. I'm talking about pharmaceutical drugs, um, but we're talking about Tylenol, Motrin, Aspirin, all these various little molecules. Maybe they're a ring. There are a couple of rings. They have these small chemically defined structures. When we're dealing with biologics, this is a more variety of products. This can include often a lot of proteins, sometimes nucleic acids, so DNA or RNA, maybe a modified virus or even blood products or blood or even little soul cells, maybe cells that are modified, such as CAR T cells that are modified to say like attack cancer. So all of these are examples of biologics. And what these have in common is that they're made by biological systems. So maybe they are purified from an animal or more commonly these days, they're made using recombinant technology where basically we can stick the instructions for making a protein into cells like bacterial cells or yeast cells. And we can have those or mammalian cells and have those cells make the, make the protein that we want for us. And because we're sticking in the instructions, we can actually make them make modified versions. We change those instructions, get them to make um, sort of designer proteins. So we can have like designer insulin and things like this that we'll get into in a bit. But so we're able to make these more complex molecules. We're relying on these cells to make it or rather than having that, like trying to make them in a laboratory for a variety of reasons. When we're talking about something like a protein, we're talking about thousands and thousands of atoms. And so all of these carbons and oxygens and nitrogens, you have these long chains of them and they all have to be hooked up in the exact perfect way.
And it can be hard in the laboratory to make molecules that are hooked up exactly how you want them. And so one of the things that can happen is there's this thing called stereochemistry, where basically molecules can have this kind of like handedness or they can have different orientations in space. So my left hand and my right hand are not the same. Even though they look like mirror images, they're non-superimposable. Similarly, molecules can have like R and S versions or L and B versions and things like this, where basically the atoms are sticking off in different directions. Every time you see in a chemical structure, you see like a wedge or a dash or something, this is indicating whether the cells, like whether the molecules would, if the, if the flat thing, if the lines were flat on the page, the wedges and dashes represent whether things are like sticking out at you or sticking back into, away from you. So each of these places is what we call a chiral center. Much more detail than you need to know other than knowing that this can really matter, especially when it comes to how these compounds are going to interact with your body. And so what happens is that sometimes these compounds, one version of it, one like stereoisomer might be harmful, such as in the case of thalidomide, or both versions might, not, only one version might be biologically active. So even if its other version isn't harmful, it's not helpful. And, and so you're reducing the yield. And if you imagine that every time you see one of those big molecules and you see a wedge or a dash or something like this, this is indicating a place where there could be um, both structures be made. And typically when you make things in a laboratory, what's going to happen is that the molecules are going to they're going to make both of these versions. And then both of these versions that that's at one site. Now imagine if you have this happening at multiple sites throughout a protein or throughout some other molecule, even in a small molecule, you can get a variety of different um, products. And these can this can be a really hard problem. Now our cells are able to, and cells are able to solve this problem because cells, they're not just making things by mixing molecules in a tube and heating them up. Instead, in cells, what's often happening is that these proteins are being made or these compounds are being made with the help of enzymes. So enzymes are typically proteins, sometimes um, protein RNA complexes, sometimes just RNA alone. And what they're doing is they're basically catalyzing or helping speed up reactions. And they do so by holding the molecules in the right orientation, holding things in the right way to react. So these molecules are going to get made with, the with all these atoms sticking out in the right directions to interact in various ways in the body. And then the various things that they need to interact with in the body are going to be shaped so that they recognize those specific forms. And so it would be really hard to get the right stereochemistry in the laboratory and you have to like try to isolate out all these different versions and these steps along the way, as well as the different side reactions that you can have occurring because you don't have all the enzyme and all the other machinery that's kind of designed to do this that can help make it so that you're getting the products that you want and not other things. And so as a result, these cells are going to be able to make these big complex structures that we're not able to, um, we're not able to synthesize from scratch in the lab. So we can have these big, more complex structures, but these structures can actually vary. Their exact composition, composition can vary as opposed to when we have a small molecule that we have is chemically defined. So each version of a small molecule is going, each copy is going to be exactly the same even if they're made by different labs at different times or things like this. You can stick these on a machine, uh, maybe like an LCMS and actually see that, yes, these are exactly the same. What happens though, is that when you give cells the instructions for making a protein, there's this ge universal genetic code. And so no matter what type of cells you stick that those genetic instructions into, the cells will kind of be able to read the genetic instructions and piece together the protein. And so when we talk about putting together a protein, this is a process called translation. And so all of these cells, you can stick the genetic instructions in, the cells will translate them um, and make a protein. And they'll make that same protein originally in terms of like what amino acids are added. And so proteins are these long chains of amino acids that fold up into these pretty structures um, based on which amino acids are in the chain and which order and things like this. And so all of these amino acids get added together and then the protein folds up. 
Well, then what can happen is you can actually get modifications to those amino acids that have after they've been incorporated into the protein. So after that protein has been translated, well, now you can get things called post-translational modifications. These include things like acetylation and methylation and phosphorylation, things like oxidation and hydroxylation. Yeah, there's a lot of modifications that can happen. And one of the big ones is um, glycosylation, so the addition of sugar chains. And all these modifications can get added in different ways in different places on the protein. This is going to vary not only from cell type to cell type. So not only is the glycosylation patterns in, say, an insect cell going to be different than a mammalian cell, well, even the same type of cell, just like a different batch of it could be different. And even in, in the same batch, you could have different, each of those copies of the protein could have slightly different modifications. So the exact composition of the mixture of this um, like biologic compound is actually going to be a sort of mixture. And as a result, you have more variability and it's harder to, you can't like, identically copy it. You don't even have identical copies really within the same mixture. And so instead of talking about like generics, we have the equivalent, which we call biosimilars. So a biosimilar is basically a generic version of a biologic, whereas a generic is going to be a generic or like non-branding -brand version of a small molecule. Um, biosimilars, as we'll talk about, um, they have, they're basically going to, they just have to show that they're like non-inferior to the biologic, but there's a big process in order to, for the patent to expire and things like this, which has made it so that biosimilars, um, a lot of these biologics that are really popular, they don't have biosimilars on the market yet. And we'll get more into this when we talk about an example called Humira, which is a monoclonal antibody that's used to treat some autoimmune diseases. And we'll get much more into monoclonal antibodies as well as other types of biologics that you might encounter. Because these molecules are going to be bigger and more complex, um, they're often, even though the cells are making doing the real hard work, well then this of making the proteins, then the scientists have to actually get the cells to make the proteins and purify out those proteins. Or if it's not proteins, if it's cells or something like this, Basically, there's a lot of optimization, a lot of purification, a lot of regulation, various steps in the process that are going to make biologics often much more expensive than your typical small molecule. Um, even once these are made, then they often are less stable than your small molecules. So with your small molecules, you often, you go to the pharmacy, you pick up a bottle of, bottle of pills, you use, these pills can stay on your shelf for years without any problem. They can, when you swallow them, they can go through your digestive system without any problem. When we're talking about a biologic, however, basically, if you think about like tissue decomposing, if you have food in your um, compost bin, you can see it decomposing. Like molecules aren't going to stay stable. Like biological molecules typically aren't going to stay that stable. Um, and so you often have to refrigerate them. They have to have these formulations with all this stuff to help keep them stable. And then imagine that if you were to swallow a protein drug, well, your digestive system is really good at breaking down proteins. I mean, that's kind of one of its biggest jobs. And so those proteins aren't going to make it through your digestive system. And so instead of being given in a pill form, biologics are typically administered via IV or injection. So all of this is making it harder for, um, for biologics than for small molecules. But biologics are increasing in, in their use and things like this because biologics are super duper helpful because we can make these more complex molecules and we can make these molecules that can either replace something that our body doesn't have, that can interact with things that our body does have that are maybe overreacting, that can allow our body to do more things. And so, um, biologics are this key in growing class of molecules. And so I want to tell you about some examples. Let's start with replacing human proteins. Um, and so I want to talk about like, when we talk about like proteins versus peptides and things like this, basically a, a protein is a long chain of amino acids that folds up into a protein, like a 3D shape that can do things. A peptide is basically a shorter chain, a shorter chain of amino acids. Sometimes these, there's not really like a clear distinction between these two, but proteins can play a lot of different roles in the body. 
um, proteins and peptides and things. One of the roles that they can play is as a hormone. And so a hormone is kind of like a chemical signaling molecule. And one of the key hormones in your body is insulin. Now, insulin is a peptide protein. Um, it's a small, I mean, it's a peptide hormone. It's a small little protein. It's got a couple of different chains. And I talk much more about it in other posts. But basically what happens is that when you eat um, sugar, your cells send out a message in the form of this insulin. And this signal is then recognized by receptors on cells throughout your body. And those receptors tell those cells, hey, letting glucose and start using it and things like this. And then your blood sugar levels go down because the cells are taking in the glucose. In the case of diabetes, the cells either aren't making enough insulin or their cells aren't responding sufficiently to the insulin that's made. And so this in glucose isn't getting taken in and the blood sugar rises. If you could give these pro if you could give these patients um, insulin that you made outside of their body, um, then you could kind of compensate for this lack of insulin or for this lack of insulin response and get the cells to take in insulin. And so you can use as a biologic, you can have insulin that you give to these patients. Now this insulin can either come, like originally this insulin that was being used was coming from being purified from like animal tissues, but that is not sustainable and you have to sacrifice animals and they don't get enough. So that would not be a good long-term strategy. But thankfully due to recombinant technology, we're able to make and um, get like cells like bacteria and yeast to make the insulin for us. And then we just have to purify it out and give it to the patients. So just a note about the term recombinant. Basically, when we talk about recombinant technology, we call it recombinant because we're recombining the genetic instructions for making um, something that we want cells to make. We're recombining it with the with a vector, so with some sort of like backbone that we can use to as a vehicle to get it into cells. So often this vector is going to be like a plasmid, so this circular piece of DNA, and then we can stick this into cells and get cells to make protein from it based on the instructions that we put in. And because we're sticking in those instructions, we can actually make changes to those instructions in order to make changes to the resulting protein. So this can be done with insulin in order to make versions of insulin that are either like fast acting or that are longer lasting. And so I talk much more about this on my posts on insulin and diabetes, but based on the structure, the atomic structure of insulin, so how its atoms are connected, you can use, scientists have used these structures to kind of figure out what changes you could introduce in order to make it so that the insulin is going to be longer lasting or faster acting and things like this. So with recombinant technology, we're able not just to get cells to make um, proteins, but to make like designer proteins and things like this. Although again, we have to worry about the difference between um, different copies, as well as sometimes the cells don't want to make the thing that you want them to make. And so this can be an issue with yield, um, bring down the yield, as well as things like this. And often when you're trying to make these complex molecules, the way that you, in a way that you want to put into humans, you need to make sure that they're going to be made in a way that humans make them. And so sometimes what happens is with molecules, they can have different modifications and different cell types. And so if you were to make a protein in bacteria, it might be different modifications than it would get in your body, or it might be lacking modifications. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes these biologic process, pro, these biologic molecules um, can have a problem of causing immune system reactions. And so basically what happens in the immune system is that your cells, your body learns to recognize things as foreign versus things as cell. It does this in various ways, including antibodies and T cells. So antibodies are these little proteins. And kind of what happens is the immune system mixes and matches parts of these little proteins in order to find, um, find the, the uh, variation that is going to bind to a foreign molecule, but not to a self molecule. Um, I'm not an immunologist, but I do cover this in another post, and so I'm not going to go into the details, but there's this mix and match process, and if something is recognized as foreign and not recognized as your own body, then it can get attacked. 
And similarly with T cells, you can have the different proteins be recognized as foreign and not self and be attacked, but that's just, that's a different type of like immune, a different branch of the immune system. But in those cases, what's happening is that you have basically this big, if you have a big protein or something like this, it can get chopped up into these pieces and these pieces are displayed on the cells and then the cells get recognized as foreign and things like this. And so if you think about a something like a protein, there's going to be a lot of different pieces once you chop up that protein. There's a lot of different opportunities for the cell to say, hey, I don't recognize this. Whereas if you have um, something like a small molecule, well, now it's less likely to be immunogenic. So less likely to, to cause an immune response that would cause this person to like attack the drug rather than actually um, have the drug be beneficial. Um, and so sometimes we have to do things like make versions that are humanized. If we want to use an antibody, you can't just purify it out of an animal the way that the animal like normally makes it. So you can talk about like humanized mice and things like this um, to generate those original antibodies. And then there's techniques that you can use to purify. I'm not going to go into that. But basically, these molecules offer up a lot of real estate that has a lot of opportunities for your cell to say, hey, you don't belong here. An example of this is with asparaginase. Um, so I talk much more about this on my post on asparagine, but basically there's this type of cancer called acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL. And a vulnerability of this cancer is that these cells don't make enough of this enzyme called asparagine synthetase or ASNS. And this asparagine synthetase is needed to make asparagine, so make the amino acid asparagine, from aspartate, which is another amino acid. So asparaginase, asparagine synthetase can be can convert aspartate into asparagine. So if you run low on asparagine, your cells can make more from aspartate. And the asparagine that's made, it's often it's secreted into the or excreted into the blood cells or secreted, I don't know. It's basically put into the bloodstream. And so now there's a supply of asparagine in the bloodstream so other cells can take it in. So these leukemic cells, they don't make enough of this ASN, ANS, ASNS, but that's normally not a problem because they can just use asparagine from the bloodstream. But if you introduce asparaginase, so an enzyme that breaks down that asparagine, then it's able to basically remove the asparagine from the bloodstream. Now the leukemic cells can't make more to compensate, and so they're going to die, whereas the healthy cells are going to be able to make more and they'll be okay. So asparaginase can be purified. It's made by like bacteria. And so it can be purified out of those bacteria. And this can be a really effective treatment. But some patients develop an immune response to this E. coli, um, this E. coli derived asparaginase. So then scientists started using a different strain of bacteria um, as well as making modified versions of it such as by adding on PEG, so polyethylene glycol, to kind of hide different regions of the protein, um, make it less immunogenic. So there are various strategies that can be used in order to try to make it so that these molecules don't provoke an immune response, but this can still be a big hurdle in terms of getting these biologics um, working and not hurting people. One of the most common types of biologic molecules are probably monoclonal antibodies. So any type you, time you see like a drug name that ends in AB, that's gonna be short for antibody. And so basically you, this is a growing field um, and what monoclonal antibodies are, well, I basically told you a little bit about antibodies before. And one of the things about antibodies is that when your cell, when your body's going through that whole process of mix and max process or an, in an animal, um, this mix and match process is going to generate a lot of different antibodies. And some of these antibodies are going to be able to bind to the foreign thing. Um, and some of them won't. The ones that bind to the foreign thing get selected for, and you make more of them. But you make more of these antibodies that are binding to different regions of that same thing. And so you have this like polyclonal mixture. So we call it clonal because they're basically coming from individual like B cells that then the, that one B cell that originally made it, well, now you make more copies of that cell, so you can make more copies of that antibody. And so you get this polyclonal mixture where you have antibodies binding to different parts of that. If you purify out just like a single one, you can then get a monoclonal antibody. So you have a single copy of something. And so we can generate monoclonal antibodies 
against all sorts of things. And so you might have heard about monoclonal antibodies in the context of like COVID-19 treatment. So basically the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it has this um, recept that it has this protein on the surface, this spike protein, which binds to cellular receptors called ACE2. And if an antibody binds to that spike protein, then the spike protein can't bind to the cell and can't infect the cell. And so this is a common use for monoclonal antibodies these days is to basically um, prevent, the, prevent the virus from getting into cells, or at least this was common until kind of these monoclonal antibodies have become less effective because of mutations in, in the spike protein that the, that the molecule, that these antibodies don't bind to it anymore. But if the antibodies do bind to it, then you can block binding to other things. And similarly, we can bind antibodies to other things that we want to block or other things we want to prevent from interacting with various molecules in the body. And so a key example of this is the Humira. So Humira or adulibumab, it is going to be, it's going to target TNF alpha. So this tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is this immune system molecule. And basically this monoclonal antibody can bind to this immune system signal and prevent that signal from setting off immune reactions that could that cause problems like um, and contribute to things like rheumatoid arthritis. And so Humira um, is is a monoclonal antibody. And we can also have monoclonal antibodies be made against all sorts of different targets. So you see a lot of this in like immune system as well as cancer treatments. Um, and many more are on the way. So basically monoclonal antibodies can be really helpful um, and we can figure these monoclonal antibodies can be discovered with techniques like phage display, um, humanized mice. There's all sorts of different techniques that can be used to try to find antibodies that will bind to various targets. And not only can you get them to bind, but you can also do things like attach these antibodies to drugs and so these antibodies might say, recognize a surface marker on a cell that like a cancer cell, recognize a cancer specific marker and then be attached to a drug that will then get the, um, get the body to, or then will kill the cell. So there are various antibody drug conjugates as well as some, they're like smaller, smaller versions of antibodies um, kind of give them less to attack unless the CS4 in, get into smaller cracks and things like this. So various different various different um, strategies, more stable and things like this, various strategies for antibody treatment. But antibodies are such a common and popular form of biologic because they allow you, having these more complex, these bigger molecules allows you to have more specificity for the targets. So you can get less off-target effects sometimes than you would get with a small molecule. If you think about your conventional small molecule, it's going to be really small. So that's good from an immune system perspective um, as to not like provoking an immune response. You just have to worry mostly about like the liver metabolizing it and things like this and it getting into cells, being soluble. Within the case of one of these um, antibodies, however, you have more, you have a much more complex, bigger molecule. It's able to form more complicated interactions with, with other molecules, more extensive interactions, things like this, that allow for a greater level of specificity. So that small molecule, it might be binding to multiple different things throughout your body, but the antibody should hopefully be more specific. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why monoclonal antibodies have so much promise and are, are increasing in their usage and things like this. So that's another type of um, biologic. And finally, I just want to say a few words about um, like vaccines. So vaccines are also going to be biologics and they can be different types of vaccines. Um, so we can have vaccines that are actually versions of the virus that are maybe weakened or inactivated or just parts of the virus or things that look like the virus. You can also have DNA or RNA that gets your cells to make the virus. Um, we can have this virus be made. Um, those weakened or inactivated viruses can be made in different types of cells, like eggs or different cells. You can have viral proteins be made recombinantly, such as like Novavax, as well as some of the flu vaccines. Um, so various ways that we take advantage of biological systems in order to make vaccines, and those vaccines would be characterized as biologics.
So that's the basics of biologics versus small molecules. So next time you hear one of those commercials, ask your doctor if a biologic is right for you. You can be like, well, I don't know if it's right for me, but I know what it is. A biologic is basically a molecule that was made by a biological system, such as a protein that was made in cell culture from bacteria or yeast cells and then purified out um, and now given potentially to me as a drug. And these biologics are differ from small molecules, so from traditional drugs, in that they weren't synthesized like from scratch. They have a less de chemically defined structure. Their exact composition is going to vary because cell types vary from, um, because cell types vary, because cells vary, because the modification machinery varies, the folding machinery varies, there's gonna be more variability. And so you can't prescribe me an actual generic. You might be able to provide, pro um, prescribe me a biosimilar, which is basically a generic for that is um, version of a biologic, um, but you still have more variability. You might have differences too in the administration, um, in the formulation. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to, if you give this to me, I'm probably going to have to like inject myself or give me an IV um, because these are going to be less stable molecules. They're not going to make it through the digestive system. Um, they might have solubility issues. Um, various things like this, which makes it harder to administer. And it'll probably be a lot more expensive um, because it's of that hard, the difficulty in storage and making it in the first place, um, as well as the fact that biosimilars, um, so there's kind of like generic versions, a lot of them aren't on the market yet because of patent things. So for example, this is a really interesting article on Humira biosimilars. Basically, in Europe, the Humira, um, the biosimilars, the patent ran out or whatever on Humira so sooner. So these biosimilars started to be introduced, a lot of them very quickly. And in the US, the biosimilars um, won't be released until like 2030. The patent up for Humira isn't off, out until 2023, um, off until then. Um, and so then you have all these competitors, these um, biosimilars that are ready to ready to come to market. And this article was looking at how similar these biosimilars are, as well as trying to characterize what some of the differences might be. And so functionally, they're really similar, but they might vary a little in terms of things like, like cosylation and, so, and other modifications, as well as kind of their, um, their formulation, so how it's packaged. So bottom line, biologics is going to be this broad category. Some often proteins, sometimes nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, modified viruses, blood products, even cells, lots of different really cool stuff, um, more complex stuff than your traditional, traditional small molecule. Um, and so hope that helped you understand it.